Ideal indications, endoscopic surgery, a lot of the basic stuff that you uh, do every day. So you just saw sort of the, you know, atmospheric, uh, I'm out there kind of stuff. This is going to be everyday bread and butter stuff that you do um, for your patients that you can utilize in a much more minimally invasive way than you may be doing now. Uh, Transframinal key concepts, we'll talk about the anatomy as I go through this, why, how, when, and uh, when not to do things. Uh, we talked great talks this morning about um, open to MIS, lateral to OLIF, and I think what's really changed sort of the game lately has been the uh, technology and the scope world from a uh, lighting perspective, from a uh, camera perspective. Uh, we can see things that we never used to see before. Uh, the tools have changed. There's articulating burrs. The laser has become a great tool. I use this probably almost in over 50% of my cases now for graminoplasty patients, revision uh, cases that have residual stenosis, patients that have midline decompressions that need a foraminoplasty. So the laser is a great way to find, uh, finally remove uh, material away from the nerve that you couldn't get to safely, even with an open technique. Camden's triangle is the key to this whole concept. Again, the needle placement, uh, we'll go over certain needle placement techniques uh, for different pathologies. So if you're putting in a, uh, say you're just doing a disectomy or for a, a large paracentral herniation, your hand's going to be a little more horizontal. If you're going to do a paracentral disc herniation that's uh, contained, you'd be a little more vertical. And then if you're going to do a fusion, you might be even more vertical. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So Camden safety uh, triangle, safe zone, needle, then the dilator. Uh, you can work in this uh, once your tube is placed safely inside the disc as well as outside the disc for extruded far lateral fragments. You can do a uh, SAP resection with your burr and laser very effectively at all levels. Uh, so this just looks at um, Camden's triangle again and kind of going over the concept of if you have an enlarged SAP, you know, resecting it uh, with laser, kerosins, and a burr. Just like all the other techniques in MIS surgery, uh, this is sort of a great equalizer, neutralizer, if you will. Same incision. Uh, for the patient on the left as the right. Believe it or not, it's safer to do endoscopic surgery on the patient on the left than on the right. I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, Joel Kim's talked about, you know, multifidus preservation, denervation of muscle. Key concept, again, same principles are adhered to with uh, endoscopic surgery. From a um, uh, study perspective, randomized control studies have been done open versus endoscopic. Uh, we looked at multifocal disc herniations, so you have a far lateral subarticular as well as a central herniation. Treating this same patient with the same multifocal herniation with one technique rather than treating them, say, with a T-lift. So this patient over here, paracentral, you can do a disectomy, either micro, open, or endo. This patient over here that's got a far lateral compressing the DRG, subarticular, and central, can be a little bit more of a challenge whether you're going to do it open. I mean, are you going to do two open approaches? midline paracentral, then go out and do a Wilsey, what are you going to do? With the scope, you can attack this disc herniation that squirrels up towards that exiting nerve root, all with one approach, one surgery, 45 minutes, patient's awake, goes home the same day. Again, understanding your MRI is critical for any surgery, but especially for endoscopic surgery. You need to know where to put that needle, where to put your scope, and how to decompress that nerve root. We've categorized uh, from an endoscopic perspective. There's an MRI endoscopic categorization, uh, you know, unifocal A, B, and C, and then multifocal D and E. A, B, and C, uh, relatively easy, except C is a sub subannular uh, herniation. These subannular herniations, as you know, even open can be challenging. Same thing endoscopically, unless you're very experienced, that could be a challenge for you as well. The multifocal herniations, again, uh, far lateral, subarticular, and then the sort of tri trifecta herniation here uh, actually are not that difficult. Uh, I think those are easier than uh, a type C, unifocal. So this is a type A, type B, C, subannular, D, uh, far lateral, and subarticular, and then the E, again, central, subarticular, far lateral, right? Uh, foraminal anatomy is a key concept. It's, uh, I, I kind of think of it as a cone. There's major neural elements superiorly. Then there's the disc inferiorly. 
You want to have your needle, your scope, your working system in the inferior aspect of that foramen. You don't want to be in the superior aspect where the nerve is. Obviously, this is a great paper if you ever want to look up foraminal anatomy. I recommend you read this. It really shows you the different parts of the, of the um, foramen in detail, nerve root, the disc. This ligament right there is probably the offending problem in 95% of foraminal stenosis. It's not the actual bony facet that's the offender, right? When the, we can see patients, a lot of times with a relatively normal looking MRI, you think they're crazy because the MRI looks pretty good and so does the CAT scan. But if their ligament, if they stand up in extension and they get ridiculous pain, I can guarantee you that that foraminal ligament or this uh, um, facet ligament right there is the offending issue, not the, not the bone. Understanding the foramen again, danger up top, good down below. This just shows you some of the approach and what you're going to see. You can see the exiting nerve root. You can see the traversing nerve root. Centrally, you can see far lateral. Cases you want to start out with at the beginning include a nice alignment of the spine. Whenever you see a large facet hypertrophy, this is a case where it's going to be difficult for you to put your scope in the safe zone. So you're going to have to work from outside. You're going to have to create a new foramen and then enter the disc space to get to the central aspect of that canal. I do this in a prone uh, or lateral position, right? If I have a very large patient, right, that I can't put prone because maybe there's an airway problem or the anesthesiologist doesn't want to put them asleep because they have sleep apnea issues, right? These are awake patients, right? Local IV sedation. I'd say 95% I do in the prone position. 5% of these patients I'll do in the lateral position. I had a, a pregnant woman uh, who was uh, foot drop, caught a quina, the whole deal. Right? She did not want to have general anesthesia. Right? She did not want to have general anesthesia. We did a local, we didn't even use any Versed. Right? Lidocaine, Marcaine, this lady was tough as steel. Right? Put the scope in, lateral position, got the disc out. It was her cauticoina resolved. Prone position, C arm. We'll show that later there. Needle placement, three options. Camden's approach a modified Camden's approach, and then uh, an intraframinal approach. Uh, you can also go posterior interlaminar. That's not kind of a, the focus of today's course. If you want to learn more about that, we can. there's lots of courses that we have that teach people how to do interlaminar uh, types of surgery. Again, for different problems, your needle placement is going to be angled different. So you have a large paracentral disc, smaller contained, this is going to be your approach. These two approaches will be used for your fusion, right? So uh, we can do fusions in the spine, lumbar spine, L1 down to S1, and I'll show you some cases at the end. This just shows you. This is a critical line, the posterior facet line. Uh, you'll see this in the lab. I draw this line because you never want to be with your start with your needle any more ventral than that posterior facet line, because you can enter into the retroperitoneal contents. Then you find your kidney, your ureters, blood vessels, all those kinds of things like that. So you just want to stay away, know your lines, know your anatomy. Uh, draw your midline, your traverse line. For a uh, extra discal approach, you're going to dock your needle right there on the posterior um, disc space, and you're not going to go any more medial than that medial uh, pedicular line. If you're going any more medial than that, you can be in the canal, so you just have to be very careful. Again, this just shows you different angles of where you, where you can place your scope, your working cannula, to get to different pathologies that you have to get to. I know I'm going through this really fast, but again, I only have a little bit of time. Uh, so we have extra discal, more horizontal, intradiscal, more vertical. So I'll show you today this approach. Uh, in the cadaver, I'm going to demonstrate an intradiscal approach with an interbody fusion uh, that we do. This is the extra discal, more horizontal for the paracentral disc herniation. Uh, one line I'm going to show you is called the mid-disc line, the MD line. Uh, that MD line is drawn by, on the lateral view, uh, taking a probe of any type on the outside of the body, measuring the distance between here to the top of the skin, and then drawing that line across from the midline. And if you come in with your needle at a 45 degree angle, you'll be in the dead center of that disc, right? Just like that. Uh, skin entry for L5S1 is a little different because you have the iliac crest but you can still get into the disc space uh, without too much problem. You just have to have your uh, needle placed a little bit more vertically, all right, to get around the crest and the transverse process. 
So today we heard great talks by Louis. We heard great talks by Dr. Foley, right? 5.1, a little difficult to get to in some cases. A little bit bigger of an approach. This is a six millimeter approach, right, to 4.5.5.1. Discectomy, decompression, restoration of disc height, fusion, whole thing uh, through, that, through this approach. Again, I'm gonna jump through these. I'm, I gotta tell you, so you have to be careful again, do's and don'ts. Remember where your retroperitoneum is. Look at your MRI, your CT scan. As you go higher in the lumbar spine, the retroperitoneum becomes more posterior. So you can't go as horizontal because you're going to enter into the uh, retroperitoneal space. And I, I was going to tell you why a bigger patient is safer. A bigger patient is safer sometimes, not all the times, but a lot of times, because they have more fat in the retroperitoneum. That fat pushes the intestinal contents more anterior. A very thin patient with no body fat is actually a little higher risk of having a uh, retroperitoneal injury because they don't have that fat pushing the intestinal contents anteriorly. Okay, so we talked about that. Needle placement. This again, this shows you the L4-5 disc. If you come in too horizontal, you're going to be in the retroperitoneal space. L1-2, you'll be in the liver, right? So you kind of stay away from that. Uh, X-rays, again, look at your lateral X-ray. Here's your top of your iliac crest, pedicle line. If your iliac crest is above that line, it's going to be more challenging. You may not be able to get to all the anatomy you want to get to. Uh, anesthetic uh, considerations we talked about, again, I use Versed, Fentanyl, and Presidix. Uh, pretty much 95% of my cases are awake, uh, even some of the fusion cases uh, that I have. Uh, I'm not afraid to put patients to sleep. I think you just have to be a little bit more aware. I'll use spinal cord monitoring for those patients as well. Very careful to place my needle in a, a very safe zone from an uh, entry pole perspective. Um, these are just some of the examples. There's a large paracentral disc herniation. Patient had a recurrent disc herniation after an open discectomy, and then we brought her back and performed an endoscopic discectomy. And that's her really walking home same day, going back to nursing school. On, we did her surgery Friday. She went back to nursing school on Monday. Multifocal disc herniations, I talked about this before. Again, showing patients that have um, areas of stenosis. Uh, this is what it'll look like when you first sort of take a look at the uh, exiting nerve root. As you decompress it, the exiting nerve root becomes uh, less tense. There's Camden's triangle. There's your traversing nerve root. So your head is towards the left, feet are towards the right. This is a left-sided disc herniation. Patient walking, you see his left leg posterior. This is an L3-4 herniation. So he'd have a reverse straight, straight leg test at this level. So you see full extension of his leg in that other area. Okay, so endoscopic fusion. Um, we heard a little bit about fusion today, right? XLIF, OLIF. Uh, I think from an endoscopic perspective, I think we're in an even more minimally invasive mode where you can do this truly as an outpatient with uh, about maybe two hours of operative time, one position. You don't have to flip flop the patient, anything like that. Here's a uh, L L34, L45, as you want to call it, based on the segmentation anomaly. Post op uh, showing a nice placement of the uh, cage decompression. These are uh, facet screws. So these facet screws are placed percutaneously, right? Two small incisions. Uh, you don't really need pedicle screws if you don't want to, especially since you have anterior column support, right? So instead of um, using, say, uh, uh, $900 pedicle screws times four plus two rods, right? We just heard a little bit of a talk on keeping yourself, economizing your, your hospital, right? These are much cheaper, easier. Again, awake patient, no general anesthetic. Patient goes home the same day. So you're really, really economizing these patients. If, does anybody own ambulatory surgery center here? Right, if you, have, if you own an ambulatory surgery center with 23 hour stay or, or discharges to skilled nursing facilities, these types of cases definitely can be done in an ambulatory care center. That shows the uh, transfer set screws. Another case, 47 year old L5S1 level. This would not be your first kind of case you want to tackle. Getting into the disc space, we heard how to, how to use an osteotome to release the disc space, open the disc space, place your implant. Here's a case, a grade one, a grade two spondy. Same idea, use nerve monitoring because as you reduce this patient, you're gonna be, you have to be careful. Again, anterior page, posterior screw fixation, nice reduction, right? Home 23 hours. We keep them in hospital overnight because of the fact of the uh, distraction across the L5 nerve root. L5 nerve root can cause, can have a delayed effect. So you kind of, we observe them overnight. We don't send them home on the same day uh, for that reason. 
76-year-old, severe stenosis, L4-5, grade 1 spondy, indirect reduction anteriorly with a posterior direct reduction and decompression posteriorly if you want to, although in some cases you really don't have to. How about infection? Uh, a nice plate, a great um, use of the endoscope for infection. I'm not going to kind of go through this too much, but you can do a nice lavage. You can place a drain in the disc space, right? Leave the drain in the disc space. You can lavage that out with vancomycin or whatever you want to wash it out with. So an in and out type of drainage system. Adjacent level fr uh, foraminal stenosis, patients that have prior fusions, they don't have a lot of central stenosis, but they have, they usually begin to get pain on one leg above a fusion, and you'll see most of the time it's because of the subarticular stenosis that's evident on the hypertrophic facet joints. So instead of doing an adjacent level fusion on this patient, uh, we do a scope. We, as we do our scope, we're going to resect this portion of the SAP, right? This resecting of the SAP and that ligament, like I talked about, will alleviate this patient's pain quite nicely. This is how the needle is placed underneath the screw head and underneath the rod. There's our scope. We look at our view. So this is the facet that was there. This facet was resected using a burr, some laser. Root is right here. You see this root right there? And then finally, intrafacet decompression. Um, pretty rare um, indication to do an intrafacet decompression, but it's possible if you're careful understand your anatomy, you're just going to core straight down through that facet with your scope and your burr. You'll get a kerosene, right? Once you get through that facet, take your kerosene, spin it underneath the facet, and be able to resect that facet um, joint quite nicely. So that's what I have for the talk. Now I have 10 minutes to run next door and do a disectomy infusion for you. 